Let's start. So welcome everybody to this late afternoon session on Spring Data, Hypermedia and a little bit of cloud development. My name is Christoph Strober and I obviously work for Pivotal as part of the Spring Data team and as the Spring Data team, as a member of the Spring Data team, I'm uh, responsible for some data access layers. So the main goal that Spring Data has is the more or less defined by our project lead, which is Oliver Gierke. And we want to provide you with a familiar and consistent Spring-based programming model while retaining store-specific uh, capabilities and features. So we want to give you a, a Spring feeling when interacting with data stores, uh, different data stores like uh, JPA and let's say MongoDB, so that if you're consistent programming modeling, find your way through it uh, very nicely uh, while we still allow you to access native stuff in MongoDB, Neo4j, JPA, whatever. As I already mentioned, we have of course, several modules. So uh, we form around uh, a common module, so which is the, the commons part. We have something for the rela relational world, which is uh, Spring Data JPA, and then a lot of stuff for uh, non-relational stores, such as MongoDB uh, Gemfire, if you're into data grids. Uh, we have a dedicated key value module that operates on in-memory uh, maps, more or less. I mean, you can use off-heap maps if you want to. We have something for Redis. We have Cassandra, which uh, recently moved into the core module, which means that it is officially maintained by Pivotal employees. We got something for the Apache Solar project. And then there is the, the one we're going to talk about today uh, more, uh, the odd one out that Spring Data REST that basically sits on top of the JP, uh, on top of the Spring Data implementations and allows you to expose your uh, data access layer as a REST resource. Additionally, we got several community modules, which we're very proud of. Uh, first of all, uh, Couchbase, Elasticsearch. Then the guys uh, from Neo4j, if you're like graph databases, uh, databases have their Spring Data module. There is Reason, there recently was added a Hazelcast module that was announced about uh, two months ago. Uh, we got something for Create and Aerospike. So those community modules are not maintained by us, but led by the community and the companies behind those technologies, more or less. We uh, cooperate with those, uh, help them out, inform them about the upcoming changes in Commons module and so on and so forth. But today, we're going to have a look at uh, what we hopefully all love, uh, Spring Boot and the Spring Boot application. And what we're going to do is we're going to deploy it locally and uh, onto a Docker container. Uh, everybody seems to love Docker, and it's pretty easy to do so to just start your, your Spring-based boot application within the Docker container and then scale it from there. Uh, we will have a look at uh, Cloud Foundry. and try to deploy the, the Spring Boot application there in a, in a cloud environment. And last but not least, we're going to deploy it right into a cloud offering uh, into Pivotal Clouds, uh, into Pivotal Web Services. OK, uh, I guess everybody knows Spring Boot. Uh, who knows Spring Boot? Just a little show. Wow, impressive. Almost everybody. OK, so you're probably familiar with all this. This is just a one slide application, it's a no regular Spring Boot application. Uh, it has its main method and obviously we're gonna use today a Spring Data repository. Anyone in the room who doesn't know Spring Data? Anyone? Okay, two or three. Oh, quite a few hands. Okay, for those of you guys, um, with Spring Data you have the possibility to just declare as we have there. Uh, sorry for turning my back on you. Oh. My pointer doesn't really good work there. You just declare an interface. This is uh, a store repository which extends uh, a base interface. Basically, this is a paging and sorting repository. So we got several hierarchies. So we got, for on top of it, we got a repository. Then we got a CRUD repository, which obviously offers CRUD operations. And then we, we got a repository offering you paging and filtering and all that stuff. And this is basically all you have to do. Uh, you just declare the interface. We back the, uh, we create a proxy and back it by default implementation. And then with that, we can do basically uh, let you declare a method, 
within there uh, let's, uh, with a certain prefix, so find by is the prefix, and then you just declare your properties in there. So uh, find by address location, so this is obviously an address uh, property that has a location within it, and then you want to execute a geospatial query, so it's a new query, take a location, a distance, and uh, we want to page through the results, so we give it a page table starting, given the range, and return obviously a page that tells us, hey, there is a next page, there's a previous page. No implementation that you have to do on your own at this time, because we can derive all the query stuff for you uh, at boot up time. So we take the meta model, back it, uh, execute the query for you once you invoke the, the method. So that's what Spring Data basically does for you. It takes away all the everyday tasks for data access. But how does hypermedia play a role in all of this? Well, first of all, what is basically hypermedia? What does it mean? I mean, is it uh, just take any, any application you have at Spring MVC and then just expose what you have as JSON? Uh, I'd say no. Well, you could just plain HTTP and JSON, which isn't quite correct, and it's not about HTTP and uh, XML either. So what hypermedia actually is, it's, it's the presentation of data and navigation controls at the same time. So it's more or less about uh, different representation formats. It's obviously about JSON because it's very, very a uh, common format these days, uh, it allows us to use HTTP verbs to interact with the, with the server. And uh, in the center of all of this, there is more or less the, the Hator's principle. And in the next couple of minutes, we're going to have a look at some of these uh, buzzwords, let's call them so, and, and principles behind the technology. First of all, uh, Hator's uh, means is uh, hypermedia is the engine of application state. Um, if I think back to the days when I was developing applications for companies, uh, mainly web-based applications, uh, I was given those huge specifications of, of web APIs that would return me uh, if I call that endpoint. It gives me that bunch of JSON and I have to figure the ID of some element in there and then put it into this URL at this place and fire the next call to navigate through my API. Well, uh, with A2S, we have, uh, hopefully don't have to do this anymore. So first of all, the first principle is more or less uh, the media type describes what, how the resource looks like and how to treat the resource that you get in a response. Then all the actions are executed just by following links. So if a link isn't there, I obviously cannot trigger uh, an action there. So for, if you take the paging example, if I have a next link, I can go to a next page. If there is no next link, there won't be any next page. So there you take away the logic from the client, because the client just doesn't have to know, oh, there is a, a total of 1,000 elements, and if I'm, I'm not there already in some counter, then I have to display a next link. You just go through the response you get from the server, and the server tells you, hey, just render the next link. Uh, the response obviously reflects the state that is, was present at the server at the time the request was, uh, was processed, and clients uh, explore the API instead of you were given this huge uh, specification and have to think about it yourself. And uh, one, one th big benefit is that you, it allows you to easily change uh, your API or move your API from one server to another, because if you think about it, if you change the link URL, you're pointing to automatically change changes with it, so you don't have to rewrite potentially your client because just you move to another server or namespace. Okay, but what we need in first place is we need uh, the the hypermedia format that that describes the resource and how is the hypertext application language. It's a really, really simple, small uh, format for hyperlinking resources. And what that means, I'll, I'll show you in a bit. So basically, HAL is about resources. 
and every resource uh, contains uh, several links. And the link has obviously, obviously a name and a target. A resource can have an embedded resource, that is the resource itself, and it has state, but mustn't have, but can. So what this looks like if you are, we are looking at the real response. This is, uh, if you look at it, the HAL format is, uh, defines those underscore elements because you wouldn't normally have that in your JSON, JSON response. So there is those links. Then there is the embedded stuff. And down there, the page uh, is the state that happened to be at the server. So this is uh, the response for a stores resource that would give me just the stores uh, we defined before. And what you see there, is uh, that you have those first, previous, and, ne uh, and next links. Those are, are the verbs, basically, your client, uh, the elements your client is looking for. So you, you don't parse the URL or anything out of it. You just look for, let's say, the next reference and follow the link to the next reference if uh, the client wants to go there. Then we got the, the embedded stuff, which is uh, just the, the response to uh, what we requested. So we were requesting some stores, and we get a store back. And then we got the state, which tells us, OK, we're on page one. We have a total of whatever elements, and we requested just, just one element. OK. Now, we know we have uh, to follow links, and we have to interact uh, with the, we, we know the format that we have, but what we actually don't know is which operations we can execute on a specific resource, because the API doesn't tell us yet. And this is exactly where ALPS, the application level profile semantics, come into play, because they close the gap uh, between the state and the transition of state. How does this work? So basically, ALPS gives us a, a set of descriptors. And there is a semantic descriptor, which basically is just plain data. Then we got a safe descriptor, which is, uh, translates to a HTTP GET request. We got unsafe, which modifies some state there, which is post. And we got item potent, which is put and delete requests. And this looks more or less like this. So th if you'll have a look at the lower part down there, uh, you basically got uh, the, the name of the resource, which is store. Uh, the type is safe, so you can basically execute uh, a GET request against the store, a store's resource, and you get back, uh, and you can have uh, several parameters there. So you can have a page parameter, which is the page to return. You can give it a size, and you can pass in some sort. Uh, those are also within the descriptors. Uh, Spring Data REST allows you to modify those uh, description tags by using language resources. So you can basically uh, internationalize uh, those uh, descriptors. And it also tells you the return type, which is the RT parameter down there. Uh, and this links uh, to the store representation. You see the, the hash there. Uh, going to the descriptors up to the stores representation, which goes to the last part that we have, and this, this is basically the JSON schema, uh, which describes the format of your data in the response to the client. Oops, sorry. And this is pretty straightforward. So this is just, it gives you the, the properties of a type store, uh, which has obviously address and the name, and uh, within the address property, you basically get the, the reference down to the descriptor for the address, and there you have properties like zip, city, street, and location, and the location itself is a, a normal point with x and y coordinates. Okay, so much to the uh, concepts behind Spring Data REST and what we're building uh, upon. So Spring Data REST, if we have a look at it, all we need is a simple Spring Boot starter. And then we're good to go by adding just uh, a REST resource uh, with a relation. Because oh, we heard before that uh, you access those by name and not by some, some uh, URI pattern. So we give the, the resource a name and just uh, expose the find by address location near point. 
uh, method uh, to the client via the by location relation. And by adding Spring Data REST to all that stuff, we basically allow you to expose your repository as a REST resource, so you get a, a, an HTTP endpoint there. We translate relations uh, within your domain model into links between those resources, if you want to. The IDs of your domain types become part of the URI, so they don't, won't be exposed as part of the, of the JSON response, but they are embedded in the URI itself as the link ID. We will translate the uh, properties tagged with add version as e tags, so you can basically uh, fire conditional get or put requests against uh, the resource you, you have, and those will be evaluated and give you potentially a precondition failed exception. And uh, we use the property tagged with at last modified date as the last modified date for caching of those resources within the response header. Okay, so let's try this local. What we need to do so is in first place, since it's a boot project, we need the, sorry for using Maven, we just use the Spring Boot Maven plugin and then call Spring Boot Run and hopefully it will look like this. Okay, Maven Spring Boot Run. While that starts up, I'll show you the application itself. So you see it's, oh, that's small. Can you read it in the back? Otherwise, I'll have to increase font size. Is it okay? Okay, sorry. Come on, apply, better? I guess so, okay, perfect. Okay, so this is just a regular Spring Boot application. We got the, the Spring application run method in there. We got the store I talked before, so the application basically loads a, a set of Starbucks stores uh, taken from some arbitrary data source in the US, puts it into a MongoDB database and then exposes this as a REST resource. So this is the store with the ID, a name, an address. The address has, as we heard before, city, street, zip, and a point, which is a location that we will be indexing with a 2D sphere index. And we got the store repository. It's just a paging and sorting repository. We got the REST resource defined down here. And that's all we need for now. I mean, there is some, some story initializer just making sure that the data is loaded into the application on startup. And that's basically it. So the application should have started and then we are ready to go to just have a look down here. So this is what the application does. It just takes some point in the US and tries to find Starbucks or coffees around that location. Uh, I guess it's an Angular application since Thomas did it, did it and he pretty much likes Angular. But the interesting stuff is down here, which is the API-stores endpoint. And here we have exactly what I was talking about before. So we expose the, the endpoint to the stores resource as a REST resource. And uh, since it's a paging and sorting repository, you can basically, you can go through the data page by page, uh, like we have here. So we are on the first page, uh, we can go to the next page with a size of 20, just go there. Or as I talked before, we can go to the last page. And yeah, since this is the last page, there is no next link anymore. So this is Spring Data handles all that for you by checking and rendering the links already correctly. We got the embedded stuff in here with all the links, and we can, of course, follow the link to such a store by just following it. Following it, sorry. Uh, the health format always defines the, the self link, so you can basically always go back to, to the store itself. We got, additionally, we got exposed the, do I have it here? No. Yeah, 
we get the ops descriptors, which points to the store resource and exposes us all everything we can do with the stores resource. So we get the stores uh, resource itself, which is a get request, and we can all the stuff we saw before. Since it's a paging and sorting repository that extends a CRUD repository, we can of course do something like a delete the store, update the store, and here is the by location reference uh, resource that we exposed before. So it's even here and it tells me the parameter is a location, a distance, and the pageable. Pretty impressive so far since we just defined uh, the method down here. So it takes the meta model and just renders that stuff. Okay, and we got the exposed the JSON schema of our resource by just following the stuff I showed you before. Nice, that worked pretty fine. Now let's go on and see. Okay, so that worked. We saw that uh, we have the REST resource exposed. Uh, we got all the, the data we wanted and we got this game, uh, this stuff. So let's, and we did it locally. So let's try all of this a little bit in the cloud. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna deploy that stuff into a Docker container. To do so, first of all, we need a Docker file. So this is just uh, copied from, from the resource you can find uh, out on the net. Uh, just uh, wanted to mention, you put that stuff in there to just make it start a little bit faster. Uh, what we also need is a uh, Maven plugin for Docker. Uh, it's probably not the best one that I chose. There, there are several out there on the net. Just, just pick one. It, it won't matter. And then we build the Docker image out of that stuff. Okay. So, if you have a look down here, so we got Docker images. I've got the Spring Data Restbox stuff down here, and I should be able to just start it. And yeah, it's obviously the same application. Starts up pretty fast. Normally everything runs. Um, you can see this is the Docker host on my local machine uh, we're connecting to. And we have all the same stuff in here. Uh, the link's already changed. So if we, do I have it still open? Let me. Yeah, you see, we got the local host down here, and so there is no need for a client update or rewrite just because you changed the endpoint, because uh, the URLs within your API automatically change uh, to where you want to go. Um, all you have to do is basically give the application the main entry point, and then it will follow, make its way through your API. Okay, so this works pretty fine, but uh, since this is a live, uh, live demo, and I always, uh, it always happens to me that things fail during a live demo, uh, I want to show you just this. Uh, this is basically, oops, damn it. Some user entered a bad request, and my application crashed, so it's not running anymore. Docker PS, so you see there, there is only a MongoDB instance running. Uh, but my application is gone. Of course, I could tell uh, Docker now to just, hey, if the application crashes, just don't care about it, reboot it. Uh, that's basically what, what many people do, and it's pretty straightforward and works pretty fine. But during the downtime, um, what happens to your route? and to your application and all the, the stuff that fails. So what you want to do is you want to basically scale your application. And I mean, the, those uh, RESTful applications and hypermedia APIs are pretty well suited for scaling because they, by nature, don't have hold any state. So you can horizontally scale them and just add instances as, as you go. And uh, But you want to hide them bet uh, behind a single endpoint and then route from there and detect, oh, damn it, the server went down, just, just route your request to the next server and so on. Mm. Okay, let's do this. 
So we saw how it ran on Docker. It worked pretty fine, pretty easy. Um, let's deploy it into a cloud environment, which is uh, in first place uh, PCF Dev. Any anyone here knows uh, Cloud Foundry at all? At least a few hands. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at the Cloud Foundry for a moment. I mean, Cloud Foundry is a is a is a platform, a real uh, cloud platform. It has uh, all this those routing capabilities in there. It has authentication. It has a dedicated cloud controller. It has it has monitoring, uh, log aggregation. So streaming all the log files from your different servers into into your console. It has service brokers and marketplace. It has a message bus built in. So for me, that was at first, when I first looked at Cloud Foundry, oh, that's huge. And it really is. It really is. But there is, for developers, a pretty easy way to just try your application in the cloud environment. And the way to go is, at, for me at the moment, PCF Dev, which is uh, pretty straight straightforward. You just follow a link, download that stuff, and call CF, which is a command line tool, Dev, start. And that's all you have to do. This will spin up, a, uh, download and spin up a VM and put a Cloud Foundry distribution, a small one, obviously, into that VM. And in the best place, it just looks like this. You see, you say, CF Dev Start, uh, and you get an, a login URL and a user and a password that you can log on to. Uh, one word of caution, don't be afraid uh, when it doesn't start up as quickly. I mean, there is a lot of provisioning going on inside the distribution, so it takes 10 to 15 minutes to start, actually. But once it's there, it's pretty fast, and you have a cloud environment on your local developer machine. So awesome stuff. OK. Just one more slide. To run that stuff on a PCF uh, distribution, uh, you just do a Maven package, as you would do when running a Spring Boot application. And then you push that jar that you generated. So no war in there. I mean, you can if you want to, but you don't have to. You just push the jar that you have to Cloud Foundry, and the Cloud Foundry controller detects that this is a jar, so it's a Java application, that it is a Spring Boot application, and calls Cloud Foundry works well with Spring Boot. It just downloads a Java build pack, which is a distribution of uh, a runtime environment and all that stuff, and spins up a VM and starts your application within that VM. So basically, the stuff you declare uh, manually within the Docker file is done by Cloud Foundry, so those infrastructure tasks uh, move away from you. You just say it. Here is my code, and just just run it. Make it run. I don't care how. It's something, and that works because Spring Boot and Cloud Foundry are like this. They are really close friends. And the as Cloud Foundry is a platform, this also works on Blue Mix. So not also uh, not only on on Pivotal stuff, but also on all the other Cloud Foundry distributions in there. And then you can scale your application by just calling CF scale and then give it your application name. I is for instances. You could say um, dash M for memory and all that stuff and just scale, scale your application a as you go. OK. I already started that, started that stuff because it takes some time to, uh, to start. OK, so let's see CF. CF apps. So I got one application there. It's the Starbucks application, and it's already started with one instance. Um, there you go. There is the URL. You can look into inside that stuff by calling just CF app Starbucks, and then you get detailed information as well as the URL. Uh, you just can connect to there. You also see the number of instances, how much memory they currently take, how much disk is used all the stuff you would expect. And what, what I added here is, is uh, the output of the IP address I'm currently connected to. 
So let's scale this application a little bit. I mean, of course, you can have a look down here. So this is the, the API works just as before on, on the same URI. Now let's scale that stuff a little bit. CF scale Starbucks my, uh, dash I. Let's make them two instances. So CF app star box. And you can see there we have one instance running and one is currently starting up. Let me just move that up a little bit. Uh, if we execute that again, so we got two instances now running. Cool. So let's just try this. And as you can see there, the, the router within Cloud Foundry automatically just puts you on one of those two instances. Uh, so what happens if I now just go on and just kill one of those instances? Ouch. Uh, you see, the cloud, uh, Diego, which is the, the little component in, inside of, of Cloud Foundry, which is responsible for your applications, just detected that your application is down and just went on and said, oh, restarted it, and it, the, the routes aren't affected. So it will just, uh, once it detected uh, that your application is down, it will just route you to, to the other instance. Unfortunately, it will be, yeah, it's already back up. So let's kill it again. One of those two. Uh, yeah. Okay, I have to be fast to just go back there. And you see the, the application is still fine and it's now pinned to one of those. Oh, seems the server is back, so the router is, is updated again. This is pretty nice. Uh, by the way, I just forgot to show you what I did. The endpoint in here just crashes the application, so there's no bad trick in there. But don't don't add that stuff to your code. You want to bring it to production, please. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty pretty nice. Uh, what we also can do, since we have a little time left, is we can call CF logs uh, Starbucks. Uh, this should connect us to the to the log collector, and hopefully this works. Yeah, as you see, we got the uh, log output streaming right to our console from whatever ever server we are currently hitting. Okay, so let me just stop that. Nice, that worked pretty pretty nice, pretty nicely. Um, you see, it's pretty easy for you to, as a developer, just get the cloud experience on your local machine, see how it behaves, see if you potentially get any anything to work after, because uh, your application won't won't react as you expect it to do, and you still have uh, down here, uh, of course, uh, if URI changes don't don't matter anymore. Okay, because you're behind the router. So this just worked. Perfectly. So as the last point, I just wanted to really quickly show you how that stuff behaves on a on a public offering on a on a cloud that, that runs somewhere out there. It is pretty much the same you have to do. Obviously, it's exactly the same stuff you have to do. You have the same command line tool. It's the CF command line tool for Cloud Foundry. Uh, all you have to change is basically the, the endpoint you're talking to, uh, which was, I can show you, uh, let me out there. So you're not collect, connecting to your local Cloud Foundry distribution, but to, to run the pivotal.io. Uh, this is all, and the commands stay the same. So no need to learn anything new once you, you know the, the commands there. And you basically do the same. You say CF push Starbucks, uh, and then you give it the target, so the jar file you want to upload. And in this case, what I do is I, I add the, the flag no start. And I did this because uh, I have locally, I have, if you look here, uh, 
I have a MongoDB instance running inside Docker on my local machine, which allows me to just access it from. But I don't have this in the cloud. So where do I get the data store from? And I can obtain a data store from the marketplace, which is uh, CF, wrong comma, CF market place. Uh, since this is my local distribution, there is there is not that many services. So there's just my my SQL, RabbitMQ, and Redis. Uh, that's why I'm using a, a local Docker image. But on PWS, you have something called uh, Mongo Labs, uh, which is a MongoDB cloud distribution, and you can just obtain such a marketplace service and add it to your to your application. And this is done by just calling CF find service Starbucks and you give it the service name to a MongoDB, and then you can start the application. And Cloud Foundry will make sure to inject the uh, credentials and connection settings for this particular MongoDB uh, distribution into your application. And then you can safely start the application. So this is uh, one step you have to do uh, when you're not running locally. Uh, but uh, the configuration is done for you, so you don't have to touch any of your code to just make it work. Great. This is what it hopefully looks like. I mean, they changed the UI a little bit in between since so the the URI, uh, U, UI is a little bit looks a little bit different. So we got one instance here. It's running. It's using some kind of memory and disk, and we can access it via this URI. So this is Starbucks cfapps.io. This is the same application oh, down here. We got the, the stores endpoint that points us to the correct instances, and so on and so forth. I can use the command line to just scale the application, but I can also just scale it here via the UI, just scale the application. Uh, oops. Can you play just please? Uh, I'm sorry. So can you please just that seemed to have crashed. See. Oh, hey, yeah, that's why it crashed because I just killed it. That's not nice. Oh, yeah, now it's back. I'm sorry. I obviously killed both instances, uh, which is a bad situation. Then the, the cloud controller can't do anything about it. So, but now we have uh, again two instances, which is two separate VMs within uh, the PWS offering. Great. Um, and I'm a little bit worried. Oh, now now the two are running. You see, those two are running, and I should see now the yes, the different different IP addresses down here, and now I can safely kill one again and hope it gets updated, reflected in the state down here. I can also stream logs down here within STS. You get the, the ability to just attach to a running Cloud Foundry service and just debug it live uh, within your IDE. Uh, you shouldn't do this with production stuff, but you can, if you're still testing stuff, you can just run it there and debug it locally on your uh, STS, uh, which works pretty nicely. Great. Finally, it worked. Uh, by the way, down here within the marketplace services, there is the MongoDB installation uh, I was talking before. And you can access that stuff and just get the credentials from there and the connection string and just connect to it via your console and just look into it. Uh, Cloud Foundry itself makes sure that uh, those this stuff doesn't get exposed. Uh, I mean, you can do it via Spring Boot if you just enable the management endpoint. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it. It's disabled by default, but just to show you what this 
could do is you could just expose a management endpoint uh, and then check the environment settings. And what you recognize here is that uh, if you're running inside of Cloud Foundry, uh, Cloud Foundry automatically enables uh, Spring Profiles. For those who are familiar with Spring Profiles, so Spring Profiles basically allow you to define several settings for different stages. So you can have a profile for dev pointing to your local MongoDB instance. You can have something for integration stage and production stage. And by default, it will enable the cloud uh, cloud stage uh, and give you somewhere down there, there is, there is some recap services and system paths and all that stuff. Uh, somewhere down there should be, oh, there is the Mongo connection URL and the username down here, so this is how it gets injected and you shouldn't obviously expose this endpoint in production. I will have to kill it later on because <laughs> that stuff got recorded right now. Okay. That's pretty much it. Uh, before you actually go, there is a, a lot of spring related talks uh, later on. Questions? Did you want it announced? No, no. Uh, I, if someone has questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have answered them okay. later on. Yeah, it's, it's actually just a comment. Uh, instead of writing uh, your own uh, endpoint kill, you know, Spring Boot comes with uh, the actuators. It has a, actually like slash plat, uh, management slash shutdown. So. Yeah, I know, but you cannot show the actuator endpoint and what it actually does by just yeah. opening up the controller and showing system yeah. exit minus one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay. same as it's all? Or yeah, there's a, oh. Uh, just one thing I wanted to add, if you're looking for a client library that can actually parse the response you get from the server itself and want to parse it and translate it, uh, there's the Spring Hatewares library that, that allows you to uh, interact with such REST resources that expose a, a HAL endpoint and HAL resources. So check that out. Um, there's a lot of talks, uh, Spring related talks. There's a buff later on. There's uh, tomorrow you can holler with Spring 4.3. Uh, then there is something on extending Spring Data Rest from Petter, who's uh, here already. Spring Framework 5 and the roadmap, a uh, very interesting talk. There's something on RabbitMQ, something on Redis, who, are, who of you is into uh, key value stores and IntelliJ idea tips and tricks, uh, a really great one from Stefan and Jan. I can recommend those. Um, since there aren't any more questions, just Give it a try, go to start.spring.io, uh, try out the initializer that will create a Spring Boot application for you on the fly. Uh, give Spring Data a try and Cloud Foundry, it's, it's definitely worth it. Okay, thanks for your time.